Hello, Child here. So I'm going to delve into the first ever chapter length Invader Zim fanfiction I ever wrote, which is going to cause me no small amount of pain, especially since people actually still like this sometimes. I don't understand why. But then again, it has been years since I've read it, so who knows, maybe it's not as bad as I imagine. <sighs> Famous last words. Let's dive into Another Set of Eyes. Another Set of Eyes was published uh, February 8th, 2006, so I was almost 17, but not quite 17 when this came out. The synopsis says, ha! I finally have Dib exactly where I want him. He's unarmed and completely in my power. Ah, I can just smell the sweet scent of revenge. And revenge I shall have for I am Sim! That's not a terrible synopsis, but doesn't really... Anyways... At last, he cried, at last, all my work has not been in vain, all those years of scorn, months of research, and now, he smiled evilly, the culmination of my life. The culmination of my life is, that sentence doesn't really work, be like the culmination of my life's work or my life's effort. It's like, your life is going to end now? Like... What? He crossed the dim room to a metal table where a small form lay strapped to the surface. Dib smirked as he reached for the razor-sharp scalpel, the relishing the fear in Zim's scarlet eyes. Suddenly his world spun and he fell to the floor, stretched to the surface as the surface of what? As his vision rocked wildly. When he tried to lift himself, he couldn't. He could only stare in horror as he spotted Zim coming toward him with the scalpel. He couldn't even twitch as Zim laid it at his ear and whispered softly, Prepare to meet your horrible doom, Dipworm. No, neither of them really are the type to whisper softly, frankly. Both of them are the ones to make loud, bombastic declarations. I guess I wanted Zim to be a little bit subtle and is threatening, but it didn't really work. Also, I did this terrible thing uh, where I attempted to make an Urken face as my like point of view break or time shift break instead of like a line of asterisks or periods. It's pretty bad. <laughs> it didn't even format correctly. There wasn't anything I could do about that, so this is... Yeah, I was a uh, freshly hatched Zim fanatic, and yeah, we'll just keep going now. <clears throat> so anytime there's a line break, I'll just say line break, and you'll assume I have a row of an attempt at making Urken faces. <clears throat> line break! Dib's eyes flew open as his alarm clock screamed him awake. Uh, maybe I'll be saying this a lot. This isn't hideously terrible, but it could have been better. And it's hard to even say why, actually? It just seems like an awkward opening sentence. Dib's eyes flew open as his alarm clock screamed him awake. Suppressing his fear, he reached out a shaky hand and slapped the snooze button. Okay, Dib, just relax. Only a dream, nothing more. Zim doesn't have you and he never will. Breathe in, hold, breathe out. Breathe in, hold, breathe out. It'll be okay. He yanked his hand through his sickle hair angrily. It would not be okay, and he knew it. The nightmares had been coming every night for two weeks. He hadn't had this many nightmares since Mom had died. The thought only made him grit his teeth harder. Zim will pay for this, he muttered, jerking on his jacket. Oh, how he'll pay. You know Dib blames Zim for a lot, but his nightmares are not Zim's fault. And I think he's rational enough to know this. Zim would be more likely to blame everybody for everything, whether it was true or not. I get the feeling my sin in this story is going to be telling you instead of showing you. I'm telling you he's afraid. I'm telling you he's trying to suppress his fear. I'm telling you nightmares have been coming every night for two weeks. There are a lot of ways to insinuate this information, and there's a line break because apparently at this point in my writing, I will just throw in line breaks every three lines because that's enough of a scene. I don't know how to transition to later in the day 
or something. Oh, no, this is a transition to Zim's nightmare. No, you don't understand. It was all a mistake. I wasn't going to blow up Earth. I swear. He cowered before them, caught at the edge of a seaside cliff. Even if he was caught at the edge of a cliff, he wouldn't disown his plan, I'm pretty sure. A tall, black coat black cloaked figure stepped forward and smirked. Okay, if he's cloaked, how do you see that he's smirking? Then what's that remote doing in your hands? Zim glanced down at his claws, and they were indeed holding a remote detonator. Sweat ran down his face. I was, um, I, uh, you dare question Zim, he shrieked. The figure he knew to be Dib laughed and pulled a bazooka from behind him. Zim relaxed and smiled. Puny earthworm, do you think Erkins are so primitive that we can be destroyed by small explosives such as that? I'm pretty sure a bazooka would do you in, Zim, unless you talk about your shielding. Like, if you put up a shield, that makes more sense. But if you're just standing there going, ha, you have a bazooka, what are you going to do, blow my fragile body to bits? I mean, yes, it will blow your fragile body to bits. The figure never said a word. He aimed and pulled the trigger, releasing a torrent of shockingly cold water at Zim. His skin writhed with a thousand flames of pain. He screamed as it began melting away, leaving his bones, organs, and squealy spooch exposed. He shivered as the dib came closer with a surgical knife. I'm not going to totally pick that apart because dreams aren't supposed to make total sense, but yeah, that could have been better. I'd say especially figuring out who Dib is, and maybe getting rid of the cloaked figure. Line break! No! Zim dashed across the room and latched his spider legs to the ceiling before he realized what he was doing. Chuckling, he slumped against the couch with relief. Heh, <laughs> Dib Beast isn't here. No need to worry. Then he scowled angrily. Worry? Why should Zim ever worry? Fah! But I must stop running these simulations in my mind. They distract me from my work. Running over to the toilet, he flushed himself down to the lab. Okay, so this isn't a dream, it's a simulation. If it was a simulation, it should make more sense than a dream, actually. So, yeah, no, it, it should have been a lot more logical if it was just a simulation he was running in his head. And I don't think he would run screaming across the room from a simulation he was running in his head. He stroked his instruments with delight and pride. Okay, I say instruments. That could be a tuba, that could be a fork, that could be a scalpel. That needs better definition from the get-go. He stroked his instruments with delight and pride. His features hardened as he glanced at the screen above him, showing Dib fixing himself warm milk and honey. His features hardened like his eyes turned to glass and his lips became stone. I mean, it shouldn't be his features hardened because that actually refers to pieces of his face. It should be his expression hardened because that has to do with how you're using the pieces of your face. So it would read better. His expression hardened as he glanced at the screen above him, showing Dib fixing himself warm milk and honey. Again, better phrasing if it said, which showed Dib fixing himself warm milk and honey. And it would be good if I could spend more time on setting here. If I could soak us a little bit in this setting, the reader would be a little more absorbed in the situation that I'm building up. Instead, it's like, bam, this happened, bam, this happened, bam, 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 switch, 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 switch. That's no way to go about building a fix. I mean, obviously it's done. I'm just saying I don't think that is the best way to go about it. Poor Dibbling, he sneered to himself. Dibbling is a little weird. There's a lot of insults Zim could use. I don't think Dibbling is one of them. Poor Dibbling, he sneered to himself. Did you have a bad dream? Poor pitiful human needing sleep. Don't worry, you won't be needing it much longer. Oh, if I didn't mention, this chapter is called Foreshadowing. Because at this point in my writing career, I'm about as subtle as a hammer to the face. Chapter 2 failure. A haggard dib stumbled downstairs to the kitchen. Well, again here, a haggard dib. Like, there's so much I could do here. I could talk about how his hair hung down, like his the sickle scythe part of his hair was limp, uh, hung in like greasy clumps he hadn't showered in days. Like, I could go into haggard, rings under his eyes, 
face sagging. He's having a little bit of double vision and kind of stumbling down the stairs because he's so tired. I mean, there's so much I can do, but instead I say a haggard dib stumbled downstairs to the kitchen. He shook his head at the sight of Gaz. It never ceased to amaze him how many things she could do while simultaneously playing her game slate. At the moment, she was shoveling large spoonfuls of choco sugar nukes into her mouth while trouncing level 23. Again, I'm telling you, she can do so many things while playing her game slate. It would be so much better if I could say she was playing her game slate shoveling uh, large spoonfuls of choco sugar nukes into her mouth and texting someone and have Dib go, you know, how can you even do that? You only have two hands and she threatens him into silence or something. Something, you know, that the Invader Zim world would be ridiculous about but totally allow for. But no, I just have to tell you and then show you. It's, it's better if you just show. Tiptoeing past her, Dib reached into the cupboard for the box of nukes. I heard you like living. Gaz growled. Sighing, Dib grabbed the brand Gusto mix and dumped it in a bowl. That was fun. I liked playing with the brand names, or the potential brand names of things in Invader Zim. I mean, the biggest thing is, you know, Poop Cola, but there's a bunch of stuff that you could just be kind of ridiculous and make use of satire and have fun with brand names in Invader Zim, so this was something I enjoyed doing. Gaz raised a brow as he sat across from her. You're late, you know. What are you talking about? Your yearly evaluation, moron. They have them an hour before school, remember? Dib shot up from his chair and dashed to his room as Gaz smirked and reached level 24. Again, it doesn't make a lot of sense that they would be evaluating him and not her. It could be that it's just for his grade, but I don't say anything about that specifically. Again, there should have been more build-up uh, him being foggy and like, what are you talking about? Forcing her to explain a little more for the benefit of the audience to understand what's going on, why it's important. Why is this yearly evaluation important and what's it for anyways? What happens if he doesn't do well at this evaluation? We don't know and we're never going to know, of course. And oh, guess what? On chapters where I felt it was more centered on Dib, I decided to make the page break different. I decided to model it after Dib's glasses. It looks something like this. Page break. The bell rang. 1,101 kids flooded through the doors, cheering and screaming. One dejected figure trudged through the doors, head bowed and shoulders slumped. There's a lot of potential in this sentence that was not capitalized on. If I were to do a quick rewrite of this section, it would be, the bell rang. 1,109 kids spilled out through the school doors, cheering and screaming in a frenzied mob. A single dejected figure trudged along behind the herd, shoulders slumped. Dib's ears burned with his teacher's sneering appraisal. I don't know if I can explain to you exactly why the first sentence is awkward. It just doesn't flow very well. Whenever possible, it is good to make your narrative flow. The more it flows, the more your reader is sucked into the world. Anything that disturbs the flow will pull them out of the story. It'll make them pay attention to the mechanics of your writing over what's happening in the story, uh, and that's not good because you want them to be totally sucked in and hanging on every word you put out. Failure, Mrs. Bitters, Mrs. Bitters. Oops. You'll never amount to anything, but we all knew that. Come on, you can't throw a few mentions of the word doom in there, or some clever analogy about society collapsing. Come on. His evaluation had been grueling, his outcome depressing. What am I gonna tell Dad? Again, we don't know what this evaluation is, what it evaluated, what part of his future hinges on this. It actually would be kind of important to know that, to understand why he's so depressed about this. I really should have gone into more detail about what this evaluation was about. Something flickered at the edge of his vision. Snapping his head up, he scanned the surrounding area. There, just beyond the baseball field, a light was flashing. He checked his watch. I've got a few minutes. Dan doesn't care when I get home anyway. Tucking his books under his arm, he took off across the field toward the mysterious light. Dib is curious, but I'm not sure he's that curious that he could be pulled into the woods by essentially a laser pointer. It would have to be something really weird looking so that he doesn't think, oh, just some dumb kid playing with a flashlight in the woods in the middle of the day, no less. I mean, there's a weird light flashing. How is he supposed to see that 
it's in daylight. It's not nighttime. Once across the field, he paused to catch his breath. Mmm, Dib is a pretty good runner. He's not a bodybuilder, but he's fast. I don't think he would be out of breath just crossing a field, even if it was at a run. I mean, the first episode of Invader Zim is him basically chasing Zim all across town. He leapt straight up the front of a bus. I mean, yeah, he wouldn't be out of breath this fast. Once across the field, he paused to catch his breath. He had a nagging sense of danger, but shoved it away. Who could hurt me? In broad daylight, no less. Okay, first of all, there's nothing to prompt the nagging sense of danger unless Dib has precognition or something. I didn't drop any hints about why he thinks he might be in danger. I should have drawn him into the woods and maybe had a few menacing things happen, like a something cracks, you know, behind him, there's a noise, and he can't find the source of it, and he starts to think, hey, maybe I'm in over my head, as I describe the gloom and doom around him, hairs on the back of his neck stand up, and he starts to think, uh, maybe I should get back to my home and pick up some more equipment before I investigate this, you know, he can't just have the sense of danger out of nowhere. Also, he wouldn't be thinking who could hurt me in broad daylight, no less, because he knows there's plenty of creatures that could hurt him in broad daylight. I mean, yes, paranormal beings tend to favor dark and darkness, but I'm sure there's plenty that function in broad daylight. They're not all nocturnal. Zim is not nocturnal, obviously, and Zim obviously can hurt him. And, of course, his half-formed smirk froze. He toppled to the ground, clutching his head in agony. As his world faded to black, he heard Zim's voice. Pitiful human! I feel like I should have gone into something hitting Dib's head. I mean, the way I set this up, it could have easily been brain freeze. I mean, listen to this and think about brain freeze rather than somebody getting hit on the head. His half-formed smirk froze. He toppled to the ground, clutching his head in agony. I mean, here, let's take a vote. Who thinks that he got brain freeze and who thinks he got hit on the head? Just based on that sentence. And that's the end of chapter two. Chapter three is called Force Field. These chapters are so short, it's driving me crazy. Mama! Mama! Ma! He clenched his eyes. Determined to control his nightmare reaction, he took in de deep, deliberate breaths. A dull ache throbbed in his head. He cracked open one eye, wincing at the harsh overhead light. Okay, first of all, I have given us a couple point of view characters so far. I have given us the point of view of Zim, and I have given us the point of view of Dip. And if I'm going to have more than one point of view character, I really need to start each chapter, and frankly each segment, uh, by establishing whose point of view we're in. I can't just say he, 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 and assume that the reader knows. For all we know, this is Zim. So, uh, I should have started by saying it was Dib. Also, given that Dib canonically doesn't have a mother that we know of yet, I really don't think he'd be calling for his mom. I mean, it just, it doesn't make sense. Oh, wait, I'm starting to remember bits of this story later. Okay, it would make sense that he was calling for his mom in this story. It just doesn't happen till later. So honestly, I'm not even sure I would drop him calling for his mom this early. I think it would be better if he just had normal physiological reactions of his heart pounding and having trouble breathing and all the panic and fear reactions instead of calling for his mother. In spite of himself, his lids flew open and he tried to sit up. Why in spite of himself? You can't, do, you can't just overuse stuff in spite of himself. There has to be a reason. Like, is it hard for him to do that? Why is it a problem that he's trying to sit up? I've given no reason that it should be hard for him right now for to wake up. In fact, I've given a lot of reason for him to want to wake up as quickly as possible, so the phrase in spite of himself is really useless here. In spite of himself, his lids flew open and he tried to sit up. A deep shock burst over him and he and he fall back. <laughs> mm, give me strength. A deep shock burst over him and he fall back, his head buzzing with electricity. First of all, how deep does this shock go? How about a painful shock? Or even a sudden shock? But a deep shock? And how about fell instead of fall? Collecting his wits, you how about describing how they were scattered? How about describing what it feels like to be 
shocked with electricity. And is it even electricity? Do you know that it's electricity? Is it some other force that feels like electricity? And how do you know what electricity feels like? Did you run into an electric fence at some point? You know, maybe this recalls to mind the time when when he was prodded by his father's security, you know, with that electric prod, you know. It, there's so many ways I could go with this, but instead, no, I'm just wanting to go from thing to thing to thing to thing and not spending any descriptive time on this to draw people into the world. And that's really what needs to happen here is more description. Be willing to spend time on this. Be willing to spend a lot of words on this. Collecting his wits, he cautiously reached his hand up, grimacing as a second shot coursed through him. Oh, crud. Only one creature on Earth has non-lethal force field technology. Okay, so does that mean that at this point in time, we on Earth have force field technology, but it's lethal? I mean, one would think that if we have force field technology, we would have both forms also. It seems weird to me that this sentence implies we have force field technology but that the only form we have is lethal and we haven't figured out non-lethal yet. It just, it doesn't really click that well. What is the matter, Dib Waste? Isn't your cell comfortable? Clenching his teeth, Dib slowly turned his head toward the voice. There he was, in all his green, urchin foreignness. <sighs> the, the worst thing he can think of about Zim is that he's green, urchin, and foreign. Come on, child. You know, Dib is more creative than this when it comes to his insults. Dib and Zim both have fairly creative insults for each other. This is lame. So sorry for the headache, Earthling. Okay, how does he know Dib has, an, has a headache? So sorry for the headache, Earthling, but soon these pains will be forgotten and overwhelmed with much worse pain. Do your worst, Zim. Almost as soon as he'd said it, Dib regretted it. Why, thank you. I shall, right after we reach orbit. Orbit? Yes, you echoing chasm of echoes! We are currently in the outer atmospheric layer of your filthy planet. Quirking his brow, Dib bit out. Why so far out? Security of your lab been compromised? The smile that crossed the Urkin's face froze his sarcasm cold. Apparently you haven't experienced the capacity of a full human scream. Oh, Zim, there's this thing called soundproof in your lab, which I'm sure you have already done and your labs are underground like several layers underground i don't think dib's screen can reach that far also i misspell urkin urkin is canonically spelled i-r-k-e-n and i keep spelling it i-r-k-i-n and he's saying dib has never fully screamed before like he's Never had a chance. That's not true. Dib has screamed plenty of times on the show in complete and utter horror and in agonizing pain. So really, this it doesn't make a lot of sense that Zim is taking him out. Into, I just wanted him to take him out in a orbit because I wanted them to be able to go to Earth right away, basically. But I either need a better reason or I just need to put them in a location that makes more sense, which is Zim's base. No! Line break. Wee! Dickie says, hi, Dib. Dib had to smile. No one could help loving the insane little robot, whether he was Zim's slave or not. Really? There was a couple of times where he was dancing with Gurr, but I mean, no one could help loving the little robot? There's a wide reaction to Gurr's insanity. So that's definitely not true. And I also don't think Dib would be smiling and open to seeing Gur right now, except maybe to try and trick him into releasing him. Hey Gur, what's that on your head? My pig! Gur screamed as he zoomed around Dib. Gur, watch out! I've got a force field around me! Really? He cares enough about Gur? Like, where has this bond been built up that he's afraid the robot will incinerate himself against the force field? That probably just tickled Gur, frankly. Not that Dib knows that, but... It it just doesn't make sense that Dib cares about Gurr's safety. We haven't built up that there's any sort of bond between them in this story. This sudden care is kind of out of nowhere. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Ooh, and it can hold your big head? It must be really strong. Let me see. No, Gurr, don't. Gurr zoomed down toward Dib's face, pulling out of the dive centimeters from the force field. 
Woo! Jib's got force field. Can I have a taco? So I feel like if Gurr wanted to inspect the force field, he would stick his hand in it or he would just belly flop into it. He wouldn't pull out of the dive last minute. And again, the force field would probably just like tickle him or something. And it might have even provided a gap where Dib could have escaped for a little bit, which would have been an interesting thing, having Dib loose in the ship, and Zim has to recapture him, uh, and he's caught again either by some other gaff of Gurs or Dib messing up somehow, or maybe he doesn't get caught and he manages to get back to Earth. I mean, there's so many ways this could have gone, just because Gurr stuck his hand in the first field, but no. Dib relaxed. Sure, Gurr, go get a taco. Therein, he frowned, remembering they were not in Zim's house. I hid them. You have to go find them, okay? Tacos! shrieked Gurr as he zoomed out of the room, leaving a rather confused pig and an amused Dib behind. Yeah, this all could use a lot of work. I'm seriously tempted to go back and rewrite these stories. Anyways, these chapters are so short, it hurts me. Chapter 4, Fear. Rolling his eyes at the view the prison cam gave, Zim went back to work. Working on what? What's he working on? What are you doing, Zim? Are you driving the ship? Are you preparing for your experiments? Are you mapping out your route to your destination? I mean, like, well, what are you doing? Zim went back to work. Gurr could be quite amusing and equally annoying at times. This sentence doesn't really work as it is. It would be better if I said, Gurr could be quite amusing at times. Or, Gurr could be very annoying at times. Or, Gurr could be quite amusing and equally annoying. Period. Putting them all together doesn't work very well. If only I could somehow lock him in duty mode. Shuddering, he remembered what had happened the last time he'd done that. Right, and since he remembered, he wouldn't be wishing he could lock Gurr into duty mode. Ever again. Gurr had made his locked mind up that Zim was a danger to his own project. Me, the great Zim, danger to my own project. I must run analysis on Gurr's central computer someday and find the malfunction. If he has a central computer, you really would think Zim would have figured out by now that all that's in Gurr's head are marbles, screws, and some paper clips and pennies. And, of course, whatever junk he shoved in there like a beehive, and tuna, and sandwiches. He sighed as he clasped his claws behind his head. The tallest always did like to play tricks. Tallest, plural. And I don't think he would think this, because he, honest to goodness, believes the tallest entrusted him with this mission, because he's so important. He would not believe, not without proper buildup, that Gurr was a prank the tallest pulled. So again, another little thing I dropped that I don't have proper buildup for. Line break. He heard footsteps ringing down the hall. Again, who is he? We can't just keep dropping he without saying who. I know it's Dib, but the reader doesn't. He heard footsteps ringing down the hall. Anxiety clenched his stomach and he carefully rolled his head around. Again, I tell you, anxiety clenched his stomach. How about his stomach clenched, his pulse quickened? His breathing became constricted, or something like that. In the few hours he had been locked into the force field, he had quickly learned that moving an inch in any direction would deliver a powerful charge. Deliver it where? I mean, the way I phrase it, it's like delivering a pizza. Deliver a powerful charge where? And what kind of charge? A monetary charge or an electrical charge? Mm, this stuff can be important. I mean, yes, some things can be inferred, but when nothing is built up properly in sentence structure, then everything comes into question. Like, one or two lapses is acceptable, but continued lapses like this throughout the entire work, it just leads to large-scale confusion in the story. Leave it to Zim, he thought bitterly. Leave it to Zim to what? To devise a proper holding cell? I mean, where's the other half of this sentence? So this is like, leave it to Zim. Zim strode into view, pushing a lifter. Dib strained his eyes, but could not see what was on it. It was too high up. Noticing Dib's curiosity, Zim lowered the lifter to eye level. Okay, here's a deal. There's this thing called your point of view character. When you have a point of view character, which in this case, in this section, my point of view character is Dib. I'm not supposed to leave 
Dib's point of view. Saying, noticing Dib's curiosity, Zim lowered the lifter. That is Zim's point of view. He noticed Dib's curiosity. Dib can't notice Zim noticing his curiosity. That brings us outside of Dib's head. Therefore, I have left our point of view character. And that's a mistake. Dib's heart stopped. Piled on the lifter were hundreds of instruments. I questioned the size of this lifter. <laughs> hundreds of instruments? Come on, you only need like between five and ten creative instruments for this to be a good torture session. Seriously. Piled on the lifter were hundreds of instruments, some sharp, some so technologically advanced he had no idea what they were. If he has no idea what they are, how does he know they're even technologically advanced? For all he knows, that's a, like, a strip of molding that Zim bent in a funny angle. I mean, <laughs> you should just be describing. If you can describe the look of some of these instruments, that would have served so much better. Dib's lips parted to form words, but all his mouth would do was open and close. Again, it's not terrible, but there's better ways to go about describing his horror. Ways that actually suck you in and make you feel what he's feeling, instead of... Zin did not explain. They both knew what he was there to do. Really? Or are you sure? I mean, I don't think Dib in a million years would have thought of the role reversal that Zim might want to cut him open. Zim has never talked about cutting Dib open. Dib's always the one talking about cutting Zim open. And assuming that just because Dib wants to cut Zim open, Zim would then want to inflict that back on Dib, I don't think that's something that Dib actually reached as a conclusion. Grinning sadistically, Zim threw his head back Oh, Zim threw back his head and let loose a long, evil laugh, raising something that resembled a scalpel. So why is it not just a scalpel? He cried, I am Zim! Then it began. So just as a heads up, we're entering into vivisection territory, which is one of the things I do in my Invader Zim fanfictions frequently, uh, because it is one of Zim's worst fears, it seems like. So therefore, I put him through it a lot. But it's interesting to me that in my first Invader Zim fanfiction, I actually put Dib through vivisection. Go figure. That's not a bad thing. That's just like, hmm, I kind of wonder why I did that, actually. But uh, yeah, so just a warning that we're going to get graphic here. Or as graphic as 17-year-old child knew how to get. Zim reached through the force field. Okay, come on. I just established that the, unless he, like, put on special gloves that shimmered with similar force field technology. This is lazy. I'm like, oh, he could reach through his own force field. No. Bad world building. Zim reached through the force field and tore through Dib's shirt with his claws, drawing blood where he had grazed Dib's skin. Dib bit his lip. I won't let him hear me scream. The scalpel was cold. Much colder than metal ought to be. Dib laid it on several parts of Dib's torso, as if trying to decide where to cut first. But Dib knew better. The alien enjoyed his fear. Not terrible, but again, instead of putting this in the narrative, we could take this out of the narrative and have like a running log of Dib's thoughts here. It's so cold. Uh, he's just toying with me can see it in his eyes. He wants to see me afraid. He wants to hear me scream. I will not scream. You know, stuff like that. Again, not exactly that, but as a basis, it might be better to uh, delve into Dib's stream of thought at this point. A sharp flash of pain tore across his stomach, and he gasped in shock. Rolling away to the side, he hit the force field and blacked out. This is an awfully loose force field. I understand it's an inch in every direction, but why? If you're trying to perform surgery on something that's living, wouldn't you restrain it better so that it doesn't mess up what you're trying to do? Line break. Zim scowled. The real enjoyment of this torture was supposed to be having Dib conscious. Grabbing a small chip from the lifter, he drilled a small hole in Dib's skull and slipped it in. Small chip, small hole. As a rule of thumb, it's good to try and limit your use of a descriptor to about once per paragraph, much less per sentence. And this is a major weakness in my writing to this day, is 
uh, repeating a bit too much. Like there's uh, intentional repetition can be used as a really nice tool to get kind of a lyrical feel to your storytelling if you're doing it on purpose. But this was not on purpose. This is letting it in the back door by accident because you're not thinking about it enough. You're not thinking hard enough about what you're saying. There are ways to rewrite the sentence so that I don't use the word small twice. Again, it's not a hideous writing sin, but it does make it weaker. Line break, because this time, two sentences is long enough to switch back. Adrenaline shot through his veins as Dib started awake. He stared at Zim in confusion. Just a little device to ensure you are alert throughout the entire operation, he assured darkly. He picked up a twisted, sharp instrument and resumed. I feel like we could talk a little bit more about this device. Like, Dib is confused that he's awake right now. Maybe he doesn't even remember that Zim just cut into him. Maybe he's confused about everything. But I make it seem like he's specifically confused about what did you just put in my head while I was unconscious and couldn't have possibly seen what you were putting in my head. Zim would be the type to monologue about what he had just done for at least a good four to five sentences so that the audience knows what's going on. I mean, it's in character for Zim to monologue about his evil plots. He wants recognition, which is super helpful when you're writing Invader Zim fanfiction, by the way. Make use of Zim monologuing his head off. It's totally legit. The pain was like nothing Dib had ever felt. So go into detail about it. Every shredded cell screamed in agony. That's not detail. Dib could hardly keep his own screams back. Okay, at this point, I mean, if you're watching this and you've ever experienced a pain that is so great, it wipes all conscious thought from your brain, which I have for a couple of seconds. You know, I, I remember this one time. I don't even know what the problem was, but I had an issue with my heel where for about four to five seconds every now and then, I could feel the shape of a nerve and it felt like fireworks were going off on the inside of my heel. I couldn't think. All thought left my brain. It hurt so bad. If I had been driving when that happened, I could have caused accidents. Fortunately, I was never driving when that happened and the issue went away in like three to four months. But one time this pain woke me up and there was a very sweet dog living with us, who would never have bitten me. But my first conscious thought as this pain woke me up is, the dog has bitten my heel off. Because that was the way my suddenly brought to consciousness brain could explain this agonizing pain out of nowhere. Use stuff like that. I mean, it hadn't happened to me at the time, so of course I couldn't have, you know. At the time I wrote this, I don't think I had ever actually experienced a pain so bad it wiped all conscious thought from my mind. But if you have any experiences like that, use it, you know. Another time I remember, I bit into sushi that had wasabi in it. I had no idea it had wasabi in it. And I describe it to my friends this way. I bit into a mouthful of pain. My face spasmed. I had no control over my expression. I vaguely remember grabbing an ice cube and shoving it in my mouth. And I am like right in front of the sushi chef in Japan, by the way, probably insulting him horribly. I have no control over this. I can't apologize to him in Japanese and say, I'm so sorry. I had no idea there was wasabi in here. You're a wonderful chef, but I can't handle this. All I could say was once I had recovered, no wasabi. I couldn't apologize. There was nothing I could do. But I mean, that was another time when like all conscious thought left my brain and the only thing I could think about was how to ease it in the most crude and basic raw forms of thought that there were. Ice, water, you know, that's what happens. And you're not thinking about holding back screams at that point. You are barely thinking at that point. Your pride is an afterthought, practically. Now, it could be different for a Dib or Zim, but a pride could rank higher. But it is awfully hard to hold on to pride when you can't even think because the pain is so bad. 
and I only experienced this pain for a few seconds. Can you imagine that going on and on and on because someone is continuing to make it worse? Your body is undergoing trauma. You can't just hold back the screams because you're pride. I mean, it doesn't work like that, I'm sure. Let's try this paragraph from the top, shall we? The pain was like nothing Dib had ever felt. Every shredded cell screamed in agony. Dib could hardly keep his own screams back. He clamped his teeth together for all he was worth. You must be a bit nervous, Dib Beast. Your stomach is boiling like... The Urken frowned. Okay, point one. Why does Zim know what human organs are? When did he learn this? Does he have a chart up nearby? That would be useful. Does he have a chart up nearby? This is a stomach. This is a heart. These are lungs. This is a liver. This is a gallbladder. This is an appendix. I mean, Urkins canonically have, what, two organs? The heart and the squeakly spooch. That we know of. I'm not actually even sure if they have a heart. I have to revisit Dark Harvest. Point being, I have given us no reason to believe that Zim knows anything about human anatomy. Aside from the fact, I mean, he did steal a bunch of organs in Dark Harvest, but he probably didn't even really know he hardly knew what he was stealing. He didn't know that humans uh, needed lungs until Dib informed him. It feels like it's a stretch, and it would be a lot better if I had something there to make it stronger, like a chart. Or even mentioning, you know, I've been reading up on human organs, which sounds forced, but you know, just work something in there. Make it believable that he knows what human organs are and where they go and how they should act. I mean, how does he know that when a human is anxious, the stomach boils? Does it boil or does it just feel like it's boiling? I mean, your stomach is boiling like the Urken frowned. Dib gasped as Zim lowered his face into the gaping hole that had been his stomach. Well, his stomach is still there, durr. It's just that there's a hole there now. He hasn't, Zim hasn't removed the stomach. That isn't a stomach, Zim muttered. That looks like... Suddenly, the alien became frantic. He snatched instrument after instrument from the lifter and made rapid cuts and tears. Why would he need more than one cutting instrument? He might need a clamp. He might need a suction tube. I mean, by the way, does he have Dib hooked up to any sort of device that is keeping his blood inside him? I mean, Dib is going to bleed out shortly if Zim doesn't do something about it. It's kind of ridiculous. But Zim doesn't need a hundred instruments. He needs probably between five and ten, at most, again. As he dug deeper into Dib's body, the pain eclipsed his reason and control. The structure of this sentence implies Zim. Think about it. As he, Zim, dug deeper into Dib's body, the pain eclipsed his reason and control. The sentence needs to be restructured so that we are positive that I am referring to Dib in this. Without prettifying it up or going into more detail, a simple restructuring could be, as Zim dug deeper, pain eclipsed Dib's reason and control. Then we have very clearly defined that Zim is digging and Dib is in pain. His scream shook the ship and resonated through deep space. Wow! So Dib has a sonic super weapon in his throat and nobody ever knew. <laughs> I mean... Come on now. His vocal cords stretched until he felt they would snap, but the scream kept coming. <sighs> Zim took no notice. Wow, he took no notice of the sound that shook his ship and resonated into deep space. That's, um, that's some level of density there. Zim cannot be so focused that this sound that is basically shaking his whole ship isn't something he is even bothered by. Pausing briefly, he jotted something down on a computer pad and then spoke to the computer. Computer! Sew him back together. Analyzing wound and tissue damage, preparing sutures and anesthesia. No. No anesthesia. The pain might kill him. He's too strong for that. Just do it. Processing request. Request? I am Zim! I do not request. Processing command. Much better. A robotic arm extended from the wall and lowered to Dib's torso. He could not see what was being done, but he could feel it. Okay, so earlier he could see that Zim was cutting into his stomach, but now he can't see that the computer is suturing his stomach shut? I mean, I, unless he's 
purposely turned his head away and and by at this point one would think he's too out of it in pain to even bother looking frankly hundreds of needles stitching every slice every cut in seconds well, I guess with a wreck Zim made of his stomach, it could be hundreds of needles, but frankly, with Urkin technology, I would think nanobots could be injected to heal up the skin and knit it together, or even maybe some kind of like skin melding laser. I don't think Urkins would be using something as primitive as needles and thread to sew up a wound. Unless Zim is trying for the cruelty aspect, which he seems to be by denying Dib anesthesia. But it's a little bit of a stretch to me that he's using needle and thread technology to stitch wounds shut. But it was worse than feeling Zim's cutting tools. Okay, how is feeling himself getting sewed back together worse than feeling himself getting cut apart. He opened his mouth to scream, but nothing came, only a faint hissing. I have screamed really loud, and I have not completely lost my voice in a few minutes of screaming. My voice can be more ragged after that, it can cut in and out, but there isn't like just hissing. That would have to take like hours of screaming to reach that point. In under a minute, Dib was whole again. Status report. Intestinal damage, repaired. Stomach punctures, sealed. Spleen rupture, recovered. Lung collapse, reinflated. Missing vertebrae, replaced. Blood loss, replenished. Squeed enough, hissed Zim. How long before he recovers enough to walk again? Two to three weeks before I can safely remove stitches from his stomach. Four weeks total before he can walk without internal injuries. Very good. Turn off the force field. Acknowledged. The buzzing that had surrounded Dib ceased. Zim stood and stared at Dib, his red eyes betraying bewilderment. Again, is Dib, like, in it enough to notice all this? I would think he'd be totally out of it with all the pain he's been through. Maybe even unconscious. Like, I think there's a certain amount that the human body can take before it goes unconscious. Oh right, there's a chip in his head that keeps him conscious. Why did I do that again? Crossing his antenna, Zim turned on his heel and walked out. Dib finally slipped into blessed unconsciousness. Okay, there's a chip in his brain that's supposed to keep him conscious, and yet now I let him slip into unconscious now that it's over? Why? Did Zim turn it off? We didn't see him turn it off. What's the trigger that turns this chip off? There's no logic here except what I think would be cool, and it doesn't work. World building needs to be more solid than that. <laughs> I like my note, though. My note says, Ack, my brain's been scrambled. I kept typing Zib over and over instead of Zim. This is what happens in high school. Your brain gets flipped around, turned upside down, shaken, stir-fried, and served sunny side up at your local bed and breakfast. That's the best written thing in this entire chapter. <laughs> Well, five chapters is enough for one segment. We will continue this next time. I think I'll go five chapters at a time, which means it'll take us four sittings to get through this 20-chapter fanfiction. Thank you for joining me, and uh, hope to see you again next time in another Dusting It Off.